Hey there, it's Shannon Mapchick Myers, coming at you live from beautiful San Diego, California. Today we're going to be checking out floor and ceiling. So picture yourself in your bedroom, the plane you're standing on. is the floor and the plane above your head is the ceiling right pretty easy to picture and in a situation where there's gravity right you can actually you know most of the time we're standing on the floor but let's say that we were in a situation where we didn't have that gravitational pull. Well, as we were floating towards the ceiling, this is kind of the concept we're talking about. Um, the floor is always going to be that integer that's going to be to the left, all right? If you're thinking about a horizontal axis. The ceiling is always going to be the integer that's to the right of you. Now, if your head is touching the ceiling, you've attained the what? Ceiling, right? And if your feet, or hopefully not your head, <laughs> are touching the floor, then you've attained the floor, right? So you can, so that's why the, you know, the inequality for ceiling is inclusive on the ceiling and the inequality for floor will be inclusive on the floor. All right, so let's check it out. Definition, given any real number X, the floor of X denoted, there's like these little hooks here, um, is defined as follows. The floor of X is that unique, integer. So there's only going to be one floor. So n such that n is less than or equal to x, which is in turn less than, what do you think? n's an integer, so the next integer is beautiful, n plus 1. Symbolically, if x is a real number and n is an integer, then floor of x equal to n if and only if n is less than or equal to x, which is less than n plus 1, all right? So if you think about it, like I said, on a horizontal, sorry, a horizontal axis, what we'll have is something like this here, we'll have n, n plus 1, and you'll have your x is somewhere. It could be on n, could not be on n plus 1, but it's somewhere in here. I mean, even if it was way over here, right, even if x was way closest to n plus 1, the floor of x is still going to be n. Cool? Cool. All right, so let's uh, define ceiling. So given any real number x, the ceiling of x, and now the little kind of hooks are on the top, is defined as follows. The ceiling of x is that unique in integer n such that now what's going to happen? We're going to have Beautiful, and minus one, because that would be the first integer below n. That's going to be less than x, and x can be less than or equal to n. So symbolically, if x is a real number and n is an integer, then what do we have? Floor of x is equal to n if and only if. N minus 1 is less than X, which is less than or equal to N. Uh, this is an important concept for computer science. I've heard in my, in my consultations with Professor Paulding. So make sure that you're really, really 
understanding this concept. Uh, so in a picture, what would happen? You would have, oops, n minus one and n. And then with x, even if x is super, super close to, to, to the n minus one, the ceiling of x still is going to be that first integer to the right, which is n in this case, okay? All right, so next step, what do we have? Uh, just a few examples, and uh, if you wanna pause the movie and do them yourself, feel free. Otherwise, I'll do them with you, all right? Um, by, by the way, the on the calculator, the you've probably seen this notation, like I mentioned before, something like this. My calculus students are always like, what's that? I've never seen it. Well, you've seen it. What, I promise you that when you're doing piecewise functions in college algebra, um, the greatest integer function, if f of x is equal to the greatest integer function of x, uh, you end up with a stepwise function. And so um, on the calculator, so this is called the greatest integer function. Can't spell today, I guess. And um, on the calculator, this is how it's denoted, int for integer um, at x, okay? And that's the one that relates to the floor. All right, so we're gonna find both the floor and the ceiling of these guys. So what is the floor, whoops, sorry. <laughs> what is the floor of 28. 99999. Well, what two integers surround 28.99999? Good. 28 <laughs> and 29. Well, what integer is to the left of 28.99999? I think I got all the nines. Good, that's 28. Even though it's super close to 29, the floor is gonna be 28. Cool? All right. The ceiling of 28.99999 is going to be Beautiful. 29, because that is the integer that's either equal, and the other this wasn't an integer, or in this case, to the right, greater than 28.9999. Okay, be careful on the negative. Sometimes it's useful to draw a number line. Um, if you write this as a decimal, this is negative what? 7.2, right? Because you get negative 7 and a fifth. So on a number line, what do we have going on? Uh, negative 7.2 is in between which two integers? Awesome. It's in between negative 8 and negative 7. And negative 7.2 is gonna be like somewhere right around here. So the floor of our negative 36 fifths is equal to what? Beautiful, negative eight. And the ceiling of negative 36 fifths is going to be equal to negative seven. Perfect. All right, good so far? You guys are doing great. Hold on there. All right, so now let's kick it up a little bit. Remember, I think it was our last lesson where we were looking at div and mod. Um, remember 
4 mod 3 equals which one? Great, R. It's the uh, integer remainder. Uh, so, I don't know, for me, I think it's always easiest just to take a look at, uh, if you recall, n equals to some divisor times some quotient plus some remainder, right? So what is our n? Our n is 4 and our divisor is 3. So 3 times 1 plus 1. Cool so far? So 4 mod 3 is exactly equal to 1. Good? So this is kind of a cool, groovy situation, right? The floor of 1 is 1, and the ceiling of 1 is also 1, right? Um, the pictures would look a little bit different. If you looked at this on a number line, right, for the floor, you would be, you would have, uh, you'd have one and two, right? And our value was exactly at one. For the ceiling image, you would have what? Beautiful, zero and one, and our value is at one. Groovy? All right. Okay, well, let's go to your favorite variables. <laughs> so if you have some positive integer k, it doesn't even have to be positive, by the way, but um, I just decided to make it a little easier for you to visualize. So let's say you have some positive integer k and you add one half to k. Um, What's going to happen with, with that? I mean, and again, if you do a number line, and if this is k, and if this is k plus 1, which would be the next integer up, right? Isn't this k plus a half? Cool so far? All right, so the floor of k plus one half is going to be where? The first integer to the left. Beautiful. So we'll just get k. And what about the ceiling of k plus one half? Awesome. It'll be k plus one. All right, very good, very good. Um, now let's do some proofs. So our first theorem in section 4.5 is, um, for all real numbers X and all, on all integers M, it turns out that the floor of X plus m is equal to the floor of x plus m. Let's check out the proof for this. So let's let x be a real number. And we'll have M belong to the integers. And there's got to be some N that belongs to the integers, right? Such that the floor of X is equal to N so far but by definition of floor 
we could write this as an inequality, right? So we could say n is less than or equal to x, which is less than n plus 1. That's by definition. And furthermore, what are we allowed to do to inequalities? We can add the same non-zero constant, right? So if we add m to each portion, we will have this here. And since the integers are commutative under addition, what can we do? We can swap out the one and the m, and we would have n plus m plus one. Groovy? All right. So now what do we have going on? n plus m belongs to the integers and y. We always say it because of closure. You're going to use that a lot in linear algebra if you haven't already taken that, so get used to it. And remember, closure means in this case, you add two integers, you get an integer. So What do we have then? I mean, we have the floor now of x plus m, don't we? Is equal to what? Beautiful, n plus m. And that's by definition of floor. All right, well, you're, you're thinking we're not quite there yet, but how did we define the, the floor of X? The floor of X was in, right? So, we end up with the floor of X plus M, quantity X plus N is equal to the floor of X plus M by substitution. And we've done it. We're all good. All right. That's kind of a neat little proof. I like that one. All righty. So next theorem, the floor of n over 2. All right. So for any integer n, the floor of n over 2 is equal to n over 2 if n is even n minus 1 over 2 if n is odd. Okay, well, let's check this one out. Well, what do we need? We definitely need an n, don't we? <laughs> so why don't we let n belong to the integers? Because that's what was given in the theorem. Well, what do we know about integers? That there is something, that parity property, remember? Um, we know that n is odd or n is even by that parity property that we proved last time. So, okay. Um, Gosh, what do we do? Well, don't we have a couple of cases going on? I mean, case one, why don't we let n be even? Hmm. 
Well, then there exists some k that belongs to the integers such that n is equal to 2k, right? And that's, of course, by definition of even, right? All right, well, the floor of n over 2 then is going to be the floor of 2k over 2. That's just by substitution, right? And that in turn is equal to the floor of k, but k is an integer, so what's the floor of k? k, right? By definition. But what is k? I should erase this period. What is k? k is n over 2. <laughs> so we've done it. All right, well, that's the first case. What about case 2? What about when n is odd? There exists a k that belongs to the integers such that n equals 2k plus 1, right? So let's check it out. The floor of n over 2 will then be the floor of 2k plus 1 over 2. That's just by substitution. And, all right, well, what's this? If we were to simplify this using your favorite, some algebra, we would get the floor of k plus 1 half. Well, didn't we have a problem like that? <laughs> k plus 1 half when you're talking about the floor, is going to be k, right, by definition. But what was k? Well, I don't know. Why don't we, why don't we check it out? We know that n is 2k plus 1, right? So... If we were to isolate k, I mean, starting, what would we have? We'd have n minus 1 is 2k, and then what? n minus 1 over 2 is k, and we've done it. We've shown it. Cool, cool? All right, so moving along, here's an application problem. <clears throat> this probably looks familiar. <laughs> we uh, ended up just doing this by figuring out how many leap years there were before. I think it was in the last section. So why don't you pause the movie and see if you can figure it out this way and decide what you like better. So just, you know, substituting everything in to find out what day of the week uh, n represents up here in a, n is the day of the week and we've let 0 be Sunday 1, Monday 2, Tuesday etc all the way down to 6 equals Saturday. So here we go. To find 2050 we're plugging in years well, or to find the day of the week 2050 falls on, where we're plugging that in wherever we see an N. So we would have 2050 plus the floor of 2050 minus 1 is 2049 divided by 4 minus the floor of 2049 divided by 100 
plus the floor of 2049 divided by 400. And then we would have mod seven. So, all right, doing some computations. Um, I already kind of did the work on the calculator, so this would give us twenty fifty plus the floor of five hundred twelve point two five minus the floor of twenty point forty nine plus the floor of 5.1225 and we still have our mod 7 hanging out. Alrighty, well, figuring out the floor parts first, we'll still have this 2050 hanging out. The floor of 512 and a quarter is 512. The floor of 20.49 is 20. And the floor of 5.1225 is 5. And then we got mod 7. Alrighty. Well, when you combine all of these, we get 2547 mod 7. Well, remember that this is equal to the integer remainder you get when you divide 2547 by 7, right? So let's rewrite 2547 as 7 times something plus a remainder. Well, I got 7 times 363 and I got plus a remainder is 6. So our R is equal to 6. And so just like we found out before, well, we'll get our conclusion nicely. Uh, January 1st of 2050 falls on a Saturday. So that seems to me to be a bit more of a streamlined process. Um, of solving that problem. Okay. So here's another theorem with associated proof. Um, if n is any integer and d is a positive integer, and if q is equal to the floor of n divided by d, and r is equal to n minus d, times the floor of n divided by d, then it turns out that n is equal to d times q plus r, which you should have remembered from before. Uh, that was the last lesson, in case you missed it. And zero is less than or equal to r is less than d. So this is how the uh, floor notation uh, relates back to the quotient remainder theorem. All right, so let's do the proof of this bad boy. So what do we need? We need an N that's an integer and a D that's a positive integer. And we're going to need a Q and an R as they're defined, right? So let n belong, belong to the integers, d belong to the positive integers, such that q equals the floor of n divided by d, and r is equal to n minus d times the floor of n divided by d. So let's see what we've got. I mean, evil plan is we need to show two things. We need to show that n equals d times q plus r, and we need to show that zero is less than or equal to r is less than d. 
So let's start with the DQ plus R business. So D times Q plus R is equal to D times, well, what is Q? It's the floor of N divided by D. And then R is N minus D times the floor of N divided by D. Okay, but don't these guys have, aren't they the same expression, right? And they have opposite signs, right? So what are we left with? Good, we're left with N. So that's the first part of the proof. Now we need to show that Q lies between zero inclusive or sorry, R lies between zero inclusive and, and uh, D non-inclusive. So what was Q? Q was equal to the floor of N over D, right? So what do we know about that? Well, we know that Q has to be what? Since Q is the floor, it's got to be less than or equal to N over D, which has to be less than Q plus one. That's just by definition of floor, right? These up here were by, this here was by substitution, by the way. And then, all right, well, what could we do with that? What could we do with that? What do we know about D? D is a positive integer, right? So we could multiply everything in this inequality by D. So DQ less than or equal to N is less than D times quantity Q plus one. Cool so far? All right, well, what is that? Doing a little algebra, we would get dq plus d for that rightmost expression. But we need a zero in there, don't we? Because we want to say that zero is less than or equal to something, which is less than something. So what if I subtracted dq from everything? I'd get a zero here. I get an N minus DQ here, and I would get a D here. And the zero and the D, remember, that's what we wanted. So we're on our way, all right? So what is, what is R? R was N minus D times the floor of N over D, right? But what was Q? The floor of n over d. So this substituting that back would be d times the floor of n over d. And so by substitution, we've got zero less than or equal to r, which is less than d. And we're done. Groovy? All right. Okay, example three. We've got, I think, just two proofs. You know, it could, they could be true or they could be false, right? So th that can be the, the hardest part, right? <laughs> Figuring out if, uh, if something's going to be true or false. Um, so you always want to, you know, use like any random number and I try to stay away from zero and you know stuff like that um, I try to do something that could be any kind of common number uh, that won't generate a guaranteed response if that makes any sense so anyway for all real numbers X the floor of X squared is equal to the floor of X that quantity squared Okay, well, what I see here 
is that I'm talking about floor, right? And if I'm looking at, you know, squaring some partial amount, you don't want to do something that's right at the integers, okay? Because that'll probably work. But what if we picked something like, I don't know, what if we let x be equal to, I'll do a negative, negative 1.2, okay? So, what do you think is going to happen? The floor of negative 1.2 squared is that equal to the floor of negative 1.2, that quantity squared? Well, what's the floor of negative 1.2? That's going to fall in between. Beautiful. It's going to fall in between negative 1 and negative 2. So on that right side, Oops, we can evaluate the floor, and that floor is going to be at negative 2, right? And that's going to be squared. When I square negative 1.2, and now I'm on the left side, I'm going to get 1.44. So I'm going to need to find the floor of 1.44, right? So the floor of 1.44 is 1, and negative 2 squared is 4, right? So this is false. And we've provided a counterexample. There's a typo in this problem. This was actually supposed to be the ceiling. So we're going to just uh, rewrite this as the ceiling of n squared over 4 is equal to n squared plus 3 over 4. Cool, cool. Sorry about that. All right. So here we go. Proof. All right, let's let n belong to the integers, right? Since n is odd, what do we know? There's got to exist some integer, let's call it k, such that n is equal to 2k plus 1. That's just by definition of odd. Now, working on the left-hand side, all right? So the left LHS is, is often notation for left-hand side because we're lazy mathematicians, right? <laughs> So the ceiling of n squared over 4, the ceiling, is equal to the ceiling of 2k plus 1 squared, that quantity squared, over 4. And that's just by substitution. All right, well... That, in turn, is equal to the ceiling of 4k squared plus 4k plus 1, all over 4. And that's just by algebra. All right. What do you think? 
what if we just went through and divided everything by four, right? We would have the ceiling of k squared plus k plus a quarter. Cool so far? Well, if you add two integers, remember you get another integer. And then if you add a quarter to that, the ceiling is gonna take us to the next full integer. So evaluating this, we would get k squared plus k plus one by definition of floor. By definition of ceiling Cool, cool. All right, so that's the left-hand side. Now we're not done. We need to work on the right-hand side and we need to show that they match, all right? So the right-hand side was what? N squared plus three over four. Well, I've already defined that n is 2k plus 1. So by substitution, we would have 2k plus 1 squared plus 3 over 4. By substitution. All right, well, that in turn will give us what? 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 and that's expanding out that square, and then plus another three, all over four, which is equal to four k squared plus four k, plus four, right? Adding the one and the three over four, But what is that? Good. <laughs> That's k squared plus k plus one. And so we have shown that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side and we're good to go. All right, so that's it for today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon or evening whenever you are watching this show. And if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe. Bye.